Each week, the Bible as Literature podcast brings you in-depth discussion of the biblical text in a format short enough for your morning commute, but long enough to be substantive, posing difficult questions meant to keep you engaged. If you value this work, please consider donating as little as 25 cents per episode. That's just $1 per month. To learn more, please visit patreon.com forward slash Bible. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash Bible. Thank you. Hi, this is Father Mark Bulos with the Bible as Literature podcast of language and diversity in the United States. Saul Bellow once quipped, a melting pot, yes... A Tower of Babel? No. The Nobel laureate's comment, indicative of American norms, undermines the meaning of the parable he invokes, where human institutions, in line with Bellow's axiom, consolidate and unify. The biblical God imposes diversity, where powerful nations go beyond lingua franca to demand una lingua. In Genesis, the Lord deliberately confounds human speech. Proponents of institutions sometimes assert that multilingualism in Genesis is a negative outcome, but this assumption falls out of step with the story's plot. In Genesis, God's victory at the Tower of Babel is part of a larger war against the strategic agendas of human empire. This week, Richard and I reflect on the Tower of Babel in Genesis and its implications for multilingualism in North America. You're listening to the Bible as literature. This is Father Mark Bulos. And this is Dr. Richard Benton. And you are listening to episode 84 of the Bible as Literature podcast. One of the interesting things about our conversations, Richard, is that you bring your background as a linguist, not just as a biblical scholar, but your background as a linguist who is a polyglot, who specializes in Hebrew. So part of the context for these discussions is your passion around languages And you talk often about the problem of empire and the imposition of a specific language. Alexander the Great imposed Greek. The Romans imposed Latin. The French imposed French. The Americans, following the lead of the British, impose English, although I think the British would not necessarily agree that what we speak is literally English, but that's for another discussion another day. That just shows their own imperialism. Well, there, there you go. So we've had these conversations, and they're important and they're correct, but you were reading the story of Babel in the Bible, and something occurred to you. Let's talk about that today. All right, well, let me give some background. So one of the things I was looking at specifically was critiques about the United States. What is it with these immigrants who refuse to learn English? And so I was doing some research on where does this idea come from, the mythology that our ancestors learned English happily, but it's only nowadays that people don't like to learn English. And I stumbled into discussions online about this, and oftentimes people will say, well, we don't want America to turn into another Tower of Babel. And that's what people say. And I saw this enough times that it finally occurred to me that this cliche has a meaning, But then I brought in my biblical background and I realized, but this is nothing to do with what the Tower of Babel story actually says. And it says painful. It's painful because it's the opposite of what the story is saying. And if I could make another point. It's like saying, see, look, there's the crucifixion. Now let's go get those guys. Yeah, yeah, that's about how it goes. Like we can't afford to have our savior be crucified. So let's go out and stop him before it happens. Yeah, you know, it really doesn't make sense. And and I want to take another side point here because I was listening to a conversation on a podcast and they were talking about the problem with the Bible is that it's all patriarchal. It's about this heavenly father figure on high who is completely inaccessible to average human beings. The only human beings who can actually access this God are kings and rich people. And I listened to this. This was between last week's podcast and this week's podcast. I'm like, wait, wait, wait a second. All I see are critiques against kings and critiques against rich people in the Bible. Why are people understanding this to be a rule book for how to run a kingdom? Well, it's like the Dan Brown series. I mean, it's not that his ideas are too scandalous to endure. It's that nothing's worse than something that's both scandalous and illiterate. 
how can you claim that the Bible is a conspiracy by the disciples when the disciples are actually the bad guys in the story? The only way you can do that is if you don't know what you're talking about and you haven't read the text critically. And this is what happens over and over and over again. And because people are generally now illiterate with respect to biblical literature, they just accept these things uncritically. I mean, people accept things uncritically in general these days. But it's painful when it's in your area of specialization. Right. And this happened to hit two areas of specialization. Of La- mine. Languages and the Bible. So the double illiteracy was really a problem for me. How do you sleep at night? <laughs> <laughs> I realize it's all passing away. That's what gives me hope. God's go. judgment is my hope, as you've said before. When all else fails, just remember the preacher in Jerusalem. <laughs> I'm just a puff of smoke myself. So. Right. So in looking at this critique of the Tower of Babel, going back to this, the problem that these people see is that if we have all of these languages spoken in this country, it's going to make it so that people can't understand each other. And if people can't understand each other, how can people in this country be on the same page? How can they be striving towards a common goal? How can they be united as a people? Well, it seems to me in the parable of the Tower of Babel, people were striving towards a common goal. They were trying to achieve something, and they were united. And it's funny because I've seen church school coloring books about the Tower of Babel, and that's almost how they present them, as a vignette about how to work together. It's just devastating. Right. I mean, the thing about the Tower of Babel is it actually shows the achievement that these people who are against people speaking other languages are hoping for. You know, we had a people who all spoke the same language, They all were able to perform this incredible feat of building this tower up to heaven. And they were so good at doing what they were doing. God himself said, if we don't stop them, there's nothing they can't achieve. God himself shows that this is a threat to his own idea of what needs to happen among humanity. Well, that's important. It's not a threat to him. God is never under duress in the Bible. He's abused, but he always has the upper hand. It's a threat to humanity for the life, the setting that God created in order for not just humanity, but for all of creation to survive and to thrive and to flourish. So what's really happening is that God is acting as a steward or a shepherd for the totality of life. And he sees that the human beings are getting out of control and that this imbalance is dangerous. It's a bit like when he tweaked Jacob in the hip when he was fighting with the angel. Jacob was getting a little bit uppity, so God just went, and the guy walked away limping. (laughs) It's the thorn in the flesh. The Lord, if he's a good manager of his creation, can't allow things to get out of balance. And the human ego always pushes things out of balance. And I don't think it's a coincidence that in Genesis, where what man builds is the problem, that this is expressed so eloquently in the construction of a tower, the construction of a building, which is what cities are. Cities are almost like a cancerous growth on the natural setting where God established his gan, his garden. Cain is the founder of the first city. Right. And he's also the first murderer. I don't think this is a coincidence. No, I think that if you're an environmentalist, Genesis is your book. Because there's no book that is more forceful in its disdain for anything that human beings build. The name Babel has multiple layers. First of all, Babel refers to the empire of the Babylonians, Babel, Babylonians. Babylonian is Babli in Hebrew. So the Israelites knew about the Babylonian empire. And this is like the first great empire in this region, if not in the world. And it was able to achieve things that no one else had ever been able to achieve because they were able to bring all these resources of empire together for one common cause. If anyone gets a chance to go to the Louvre in Paris and see the carvings that were on the walls in Babylon. You know, these murals were carved out of stone and are the size of the side of a two-story building. They're gigantic. And they show the king of Babylon wrestling a lion. This is how powerful the king is depicted. And they are the ones who are able to accomplish anything. 
and God was going to have to put a stop to them. Otherwise, they were just going to continue marauding and taking over the entire world. Another significance about the word Babel is that it also means the door of God, Bab El. Those of you who know Arabic, this is obvious. So what these human beings wanted to do is they wanted to build the door to God. They wanted to be the gatekeepers of God. If anyone wanted to go to God, they had to go through them. I'm going to return to this original critique. The Bible is not in favor of those kings or rich people who would have exclusive control of God or exclusive access to God. In fact, the biblical matrix is set up in order to exclude the king. Because instead of a king who has this special relationship or a wealthy middle-class American who's talking to Jesus at the Dairy Queen with some special relationship, it's the prophet. And the prophet in the Bible is always someone whose background and lineage stands out as not making sense from a human perspective. Someone has this special responsibility to deliver God's message, but their pedigree or their experience or their background from our vantage point is not commensurate with the duty, right? You'd expect a king or a minister to be the one whom God sends, but he sends Amos, you know, picks figs off of trees. These are the kinds of details that are essential and that one should pay attention to before running off and explaining how the Bible supports... Right, whatever ideology you think it supports that you happen to be an enemy of. Right. You have to be careful of these things. So it has this double empirical meaning. One is that the Tower of Babel stands for what the Babylonians were trying to achieve. Right. And more specifically, what human beings try to achieve when they're in power is to be the exclusive harbingers of what God wills. This is what human beings want to do. So in this story... God himself says this is a problem. And then not only does he destroy the tower, but then he causes the people to speak different languages and then spread out. Which is a beautiful thing. I'm a language person. I'm happy with it. <laughs> I think that God created all these languages in order to undermine our power. I think that we should understand the creation of all these languages as being special and beautiful. And the story shows us that it's always been understood that having different languages does cause a problem for empires who want to achieve a certain thing. But the problem is, the thorn in the flesh, as you put it, is that that's how God chose it to be. God willed human beings to speak multiple languages because if human beings can create a single global empire, that goes against the will of God in the world. Which means that every time an American complains that it's America, they should be speaking English so that they can fully participate in our melting pot and be part of our diverse but monolithic society, which forms all of its views based on what is reported on CNN. Until, of course, the rise of the internet, which may have been God's secret strike against institutions. I divided your languages, now I'm going to divide your communications. Right? Anytime someone talks that way, though, as though you're taking the moral high ground by imposing English, what they are doing is working against God's function in Genesis with respect to the Tower of Babel. The arrival of Somali speakers in Minnesota, the arrival of Arabs in France, the arrival of Turks in Germany. The, the arrival of Hispanics in the very tiny, tiny box that is Donald Trump's view of the universe. Right. All these things are from the Lord. This is how the Lord keeps a check on empire. One of the reasons why empires are very concerned about multiple languages is that if there are multiple languages being spoken, you can't control information. There was a story that I read recently from a Navajo person talking about the irony of how much the United States was trying to eliminate Native American languages in this country. But then when World War II broke out, they took advantage of these rare languages in their own country in order to send codes across the ocean to disseminate important classified information. The government of an empire wants to control information. Languages are always going to challenge that. If the United States sucks up all the information from the internet, that's one thing. But if that information is in Somali, or if that information is in Lakota, or in Quiche, 
or in Uwe, the U.S. government can't do anything well, with it. And here's the funny thing. If government agencies are actually forced to learn the languages, it would probably create empathy with those cultures. So many colleagues and friends that we knew from our days in graduate school who studied Russian language because it opened up career opportunities for them when we were at the peak of the Cold War, these very same people who studied Russian language and literature and religion became fascinated with Russian language, religion, and literature, and actually gained an appreciation for those whom they otherwise would have considered enemies. And some of them ended up at a Russian seminary. It's so it's fascinating. I think there is something beautiful about the language of the other, and it provides a window into the way the other thinks and how they live and how they feel and what their perspective is. Which works against what empires are trying to achieve. Because we want you to believe a certain thing about Arabs, a certain thing about Somalis, a certain thing about Hispanics, so that we can achieve the construction of our metaphoric tower, whatever that is. One time I was speaking with someone from the Council on Foreign Relations in 2011 or so, when there first was the Arab Spring breaking out in Syria, and I said, what is the U.S. planning as far as the Christians that are in Syria? And this person said, hey, you know, I'm just not sure if it really is in the U.S. interest to have a position on that. That's diplomatic speak for we don't care because it has to be within the U.S. interest. And every single thing has to be within the U.S. interest. And what you're saying is the connection and the empathy one gains from learning languages works against these monolithic interests of the nation, of the empire. And that's what's fascinating about this story of the Tower of Babel. When these people are saying they want to make sure that U.S. doesn't become a Tower of Babel, they're afraid that, oh no, the American program is going to start falling apart. But the only way it would fall apart is because then people have communities that the people in power won't have access to. Because here's the thing, of all those people who are speaking Spanish, very many of them understand English fine. They can understand what you're saying about them, but you can understand what they're saying about you. And this scares people in the US. I've heard it happen. I've seen it happen. I've heard the nasty reaction. One time I was on a bus in Boston. There were some people sitting on a bus speaking Spanish with each other. And a guy comes up to them and starts yelling at them and says, what are you guys talking about? You guys should be speaking English. And when this two guys got off the bus, the guy was talking to the bus driver saying, you know, you never can tell when they're talking about you. It always sounds like they're saying something bad about you. Well, this culture where people still feel empowered to scold someone for speaking a foreign language has roots in the legislative culture of the United States. I mean, even in Minnesota's history, in the history of the Midwest, there were legislators at one point trying to pass laws to prevent people from speaking German to the extent that people caught speaking German, even in a social context, could get in trouble. In Iowa, there were people who were caught speaking German on a party telephone line. So those of you who don't know, there used to be a way that, you know, in a rural setting, if everybody didn't have a phone line, they would send one phone line out to multiple houses and all the homes could use the same line. One household picked up the phone and heard some people speaking German. They called the authorities and those people were fined for speaking German. German was not allowed to be spoken in churches, in private schools. German was not allowed. And this was declared by the governor of Iowa. Which means that descendants of those communities in this country who never experienced that oppression still, in a way, bear the shame of that oppression. And then they impose the very same shame on other immigrant communities. And this is not just in the United States. Someone commented on my blog, she's from England. And when her mother was caught speaking Romani, formerly known as Gypsy, we say Romani now, was speaking Romani in school, the teacher made her wash her mouth out with soap as a punishment for speaking Romani in class. Unbelievable. And this is how things happen time after time after time. People underestimate how important this question is, even at a global scale. So there's a beautiful example in the Holy Roman Empire in the Middle Ages of Frederick II taking an interest in the Arabic language, taking an interest in Arab astronomy, taking an interest in Arab philosophy and literature and religion, to the extent that there was tension between him and the Vatican, but because of his passion 
and appreciation for Middle Eastern culture and language and literature, he developed a relationship with the Arab world against the backdrop of the Crusades and all of the other abuses that took place. This is the power of language. And we see examples, even in the modern day, that can show a different approach. In Finland, for example, where they have a 15% or so Swedish minority, every single person from first grade has to learn Swedish. Or if you're Swedish, from first grade you have to learn Finnish. And just imagine what the world would look like if every single American had to start learning Spanish in first grade, if every single Israeli had to learn Arabic in first grade. What would the world look like then? It would undermine what the empire is trying to do. And this is what I think is essential from this story of the Tower of Babel. This is what God is doing in Scripture. And once again, like so many examples in the Bible, you have a parable that takes something that is a fact of the world around us. The multiplicity of languages is a fact of creation. And Scripture takes this fact and uses it in such a way to impose its scandal on its addressees. But I think the wisdom here once again pertains to the question of fate. There are many languages. You can't control it. And if you are scriptural, this fact is a fact of God. It is God who established these languages. And you have to submit to this fact. Imperialism, because it's born out of this notion of the philosopher king, of someone who orders the world in their mind and then imposes that conceptual model of the world onto reality. This person is actually fighting God because it is God who made the world. So a biblical person doesn't say, how do I want the world to be and then try to impose it? A biblical person says, how did God create the world so that I can submit to that order? This is a very important point for those who take scripture seriously. And the people in America who talk about the good old days, back when immigrants just learned English and we didn't have this problem with all these languages, for them, this monolingual America is like a Garden of Eden. You know, back before our fall, caused by whatever, multiculturalism or PC, you know, whatever. Interestingly, the Bible also says, you're right, back in the day there was only one language. And it was a problem, and God put an end to it. And that's the situation we're in today. The situation we're in today is one of God's making, is one that is the natural, like you said, state of the world, where we have multiple languages, and that's how it's been. And that's the situation we're in for God's critique against our own empire. So if you take scripture seriously, and you choose to put yourself under the judgment of the Mashal of Babel, my suggestion to our listeners would be to make an effort to learn other languages. Make an effort to promote the use of other languages. If there's a group of people that you fear or don't understand or about whom you are cynical, find out what languages they speak and study them. That's what I do. If you're a Palestinian, learn Hebrew. If you're an Israeli, learn Arabic. If you're an American, you should learn Arabic. You should learn about Islam. You should explore these areas. In doing so, you are honoring God, who is the master of all and the creator of all. Thanks very much, Dr. Benton. Thank you, Father. Have a great week. You too. You've just heard the Bible as literature. Thanks for listening. The Bible as Literature is a production of the Ephesus School Network.